Andrew, and thanks to the ALN committee for inviting me to join you this morning. Uh, I am, as uh, you heard from Andrew, about to be president of the American Library Association. So I will be talking with you this morning and try to keep my remarks to 30 minutes so that we have plenty of time for conversation. And then I head to the airport to Chicago for my crowning weekend. So I'm very stressed out about it and very excited to have a few minutes to talk about things that uh, I hold near and dear to my heart and are the reason and the rationale for my um, efforts to win the presidency of that association. So I'm gonna share some slides. Uh, here we go. And this is my first, uh, this is my first time presenting on Teams. So if something goes wrong, someone will need to tell me. Uh, so what I wanna share with you today is my vision for how we're gonna win, because from where I sit, that has to be the guiding question for all of us. How are we gonna win? It's the question that I wake up every morning thinking about um, what kind of world do we want? We want a world where public institutions like libraries are fully funded, fully resourced, fully supported so that they can best serve our communities. So I'm talking to you this morning from uh, my home in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm a patron of the Brooklyn Public Library. I have a 15 year old who is a teen patron of those libraries and the degree to which we are a literate family has everything to do with libraries, um, both uh, the school libraries, the ac uh, academic libraries and the public libraries. Uh, just to frame out a little bit about how I think about these issues, I'm a librarian in New York City. I, I work for the City University of New York, which is uh, the largest urban university system in the United States. We have 26 campuses serving 250,000 students uh, with 20,000 faculty, and I'm a member of that faculty. We produce the City University of New York 80% of teachers in the public schools, K-12 schools here in New York City. Uh, and those public schools produce 80% of CUNY students. We are tightly linked to one another. On any given day, any given school day, today is a Wednesday, so this is a school day. On any given school day, one in every 300 Americans is sitting inside of a New York City Department of Education classroom. The school librarians and the academic librarians are tightly linked in producing the people, the public of New York City through our efforts in these two spots. And then we have the three major public library systems, New York Public, Brooklyn Public, and Queensboro Public Library. The three of those together serve 55 million patrons a year. The size and scope of what libraries do uh, in all sectors to produce a literate New York City is extraordinary. We provide access to broadband internet, we provide access to reading materials, heated in the winter and cooled in the summer public spaces, uh, staplers mostly that work. And if they don't work, you can come and ask us and we can get you another one. Uh, all of these things are made by libraries. So the question for me is, how do I get more of that? How do I get more libraries? Because the world I want is one where libraries are at the heart of every community, that library workers are seen as the stewards of the public good and the people who circulate public resources and have what they need to do that job well and embedded in the community so that we can best sort of make the world we want. So that's like the question that drives me every day. How are we gonna get more library? How are we gonna get more of the things in the world that I care about, right? Uh, every inch of the city of New York that is a library, public school or academic, is an inch of the city that is not a prison, that is not a jail, that is not a parking lot. So if we expand that footprint, we expand access to the public good for everyone. So how are we gonna get there? I wanted to share a little bit about the ways that I'm having to ask those questions now in the United States. And I'd love to hear in the Q&A if these are the sort of organized pro-censorship movement that we are facing in the US, the rise of political extremism on the right is something that you are facing. It is something that consumes my every day. I've served as president elect of the American Library Association for the past year. And in that time I have visited or talked with 
hundreds of library workers about what they're facing on the front lines of their libraries. This the slide that you're seeing now is from a case in Boundary County, Idaho, which is the northern part of my home state of Idaho. Uh, Kim, uh, what's her name? Kimber Glidden was the library director there uh, and was targeted by the armed right. So one of the differences about the right in the United States is that they're heavily, heavily armed. Um, and they had taken over every part of the city and county government in Boundary County. They owned the school board. They owned the city council, the sheriff's office, right? Each of those public bodies had been taken over by political extremists who, had a, who have a sort of far right, white supremacist, fascist approach to uh, politics, right? They wanna control the region. So Kimber's trying to run a library in this context and libraries are fundamentally about access to ideas, free inquiry, freedom of information, freedom to have ideas, to read about ourselves, to read, you know, as a, as a queer person who has read a lot of queer books to try to both understand who I am, but also just because it's fun and frothy to read about gay people doing gay things, I have a right to read those materials and the library has an obligation to provide those to me as part of the public that they serve. So in this case, the library was targeted for its, uh, for this list of 300 books that the, the pro-censorship advocates have come up with in the US. And they are going sort of library by library in a pretty coordinated effort to remove books about uh, LGBTQ plus experience, about black experience, about the experiences of people of color, of people of a variety of genders and uh, have really been pushing to get these books completely out of the library. So they do that by, uh, running and taking over the library board. They do that by uh, filing challenges, lots and lots of them. And that's what happened to Kimber. They filed a challenge uh, on this list of 300 books that they said were uh, pornographic and dangerous to children, books that represent queer life, that represent black life. Uh, the problem for Kimber was that she couldn't comply with their demands to censor those materials because the library didn't even collect them. Uh, they parked outside of her home with guns. They followed her home, her and her staff home at night. They uh, terrorized the library workers and eventually pushed Kimber to leave the library. She, you know, I keep up to date with her because uh, I can't believe what happened to her. And she's having difficulty even finding employment in the region, uh, given the reach and the scope of the sort of the takeover of that part of our country by um, extremists. So that's the sort of question I have. I'd love to be asking affirmative questions about how we're gonna win, but right now the very well organized right has us a bit back on our heels. And it's everywhere, it's not just Idaho, it's in Michigan, it's in Missouri, uh, in the state of Missouri in response to a, um, in response to a lawsuit that was filed by the ACLU on behalf of Missouri libraries to uh, sort of to, to contest a parents, a, a bill that had gave parents the right to review school library materials, um, which is, you know, a restriction on the right of children to read and also just an incursion on the professionalism of libraries. We are trained to select materials. It's sort of our whole job. Um, but in response to this lawsuit that was filed on behalf of the Missouri Library Association, the House of Representatives passed a budget that cut all state funding for public libraries, $4.5 million in state funds. And in the US, federal funds for libraries are tied to state funds. So by cutting the, the state funds, they were cutting the budget altogether from the federal government as well. And this didn't end up passing, right? Like the money was saved in the when the Senate uh, reviewed the budget, but it has, an extreme chilling effect on people who are working in the area, right? It makes them, it, it makes it hard to sort of make the decision to buy a book and make the decision to host a drag queen story hour, make the decision to include a gay book in your collection. Like it makes it very, very scary because you could be, um, you know, there've been bills passed to put a bounty on librarians heads for circulating child pornography, things like that are sort of the, um, what library workers are facing. And so we're 
find ourselves right now and like how are we the world we want is is more of course than the world that we already have but also we need to preserve the right to read and the right to read stories about ourselves inside of the context that we currently find ourselves in right so we want we want to hold on to what we already have and then get to the point where we're asking and demanding more um another note about the cuts to funding of libraries in Missouri, I think it's a good example of what the end game of this really is. It isn't just about banning the book. It's about getting rid of libraries altogether. And as you know, in the US context, libraries are one of the last public institutions standing. We've got public schools that are being attacked constantly and privatized charter schools, voucher systems, all of those things. The library is the last one sort of standing that until the last year and a half, everybody had a good feeling about the library because who could, who could dislike being able to check out a book or taking your kid to a story time. Um, but the end game is to eliminate public institutions altogether, eliminate public goods and public resources. And so the idea of simply closing the library in response to these book bans, which we're seeing as a tactic in lots of places in the US, that's about the future they want, one without public institutions and without public goods. So how are we going to win? I want to talk for a minute about organizing and introduce some of the basic skills that I have learned from my own career. So this is an image from the uh, lockout at Long Island University's Brooklyn campus. In 2016, uh, I was a member of the unionized library faculty at the university on a Wednesday, I'm sitting at my office checking my email and I get an email from Ed Keen, who was the librarian uh, on the negotiating committee for that contract. And he says in his email, Emily, as of Friday, they're gonna lock us out. And so I think that labor knowledge is a little more robust in the UK. So I think, and would love to hear more about that in the conversation time that we're gonna have in a few minutes, but uh, I didn't know what a lockout was. I had to Google it. Um, so I Googled lockout and learned that what it, what it meant for me and for my colleagues was that as of Friday, we were all effectively fired. Our paychecks were eliminated. Our health insurance was canceled. We don't have a robust public option in the United States. So your health coverage is tied to your employment and without employment, you don't have health coverage. We had members with, we had a member with a, um, her husband was in the hospital with end-stage lung cancer. We had pregnant faculty members for whom the lack of health care uh, is a, you know, a life and death situation. And so when they instituted the lockout, I heard very clearly the message they were sending, which was that it didn't matter whether we lived or died. What mattered was the bottom line uh, for the university in terms of its uh, profit and its surplus, um, in terms of money, budget, not people. So we couldn't check our email, we couldn't log on to our online classes, we couldn't uh, enter campus, everything was blocked for us. It was a, an intense knockdown, drag out fight that I'm, I have shared about a lot because it really shaped my political analysis. Um, and I learned a lot about how to organize and I learned a lot about how to build the collective power necessary uh, to push back against those kinds of sort of uniform exercises of power. So this is a, an image from the biggest rally that we had just a couple of days before management agreed to end the lockout and let us back to work. And this is an image that looks like social change to me. You've got a kid with a bullhorn, you've got a bunch of people with signs, the crowd is huge and milling about in front of the entrance. This is what social change looks like, right? If we want the world to be what we want, we're gonna to have to do some of this, but how do we get here? I wanna talk a little bit about that. So here's an image, grainy, I know, from a uh, unemployment insurance sign-up fair that we held as part of a campaign of escalating actions as we built the power necessary to end the lockout. We invited everybody down to a central location in downtown Brooklyn, just a few blocks from campus, and worked with people one-on-one -on -one to sign them up for unemployment insurance. So you're looking at a room of faculty. Uh, most of them had never applied for, uninsur for unemployment insurance. And most of them are faculty, so you know that they had difficulty completing online forms. I think this is like a universal for academic libraries everywhere. Like 
ask a faculty member to fill out your interlibrary loan request form, your information literacy session request form, every time they do it wrong. If there are faculty in the room, I, I'm, I'm sorry. My faculty girlfriend's in the kitchen right now, so I hope she didn't hear me. So we had this unemployment fair. The librarians were super tight, super active. I don't know if it's true in the UK, but in the US, if there's a labor action happening, the librarians are at the center of it. And we were helping people fill out their online forms for unemployment insurance. So how do we get from here to here? My colleague Syed, who thought gathering for unemployment insurance was a silly thing to do and not about social change, was standing outside the university alone with a picket sign. And uh, he was there when he saw the students begin walking out uh, in protest of the lockout, which made sense, right? Because they uh, many of them had come to New York City to go to college for access to some of the best uh, sort of arts and culture faculty in the world. We had a contemporary dance class that was normally taught by an Alvin Ailey dancer that was then taught by, uh, they put someone in the class as a scab, and it was the uh, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who is an 84-year-old trained biologist. So just a little bit different um, from an Alvin Ailey trained dancer. So he called and said, hey, the students are walking out and everybody you see in this picture stood up, left the room and walked to campus to join the students who were walking out. And it was the biggest action that we had. And I think you could ask a lot of people what ended the lockout and a lot of people would point exactly to this rally. And it was only possible because we were organized. And one of the ways we were organized is because we were working to meet each other's needs. And in that community building that we had, we had everybody together, sort of physically and materially, and we had sort of shown each other that we had, had each other's backs, right? So it was the collective action piece came more from this than from this, even though this is the popular image of what social change looks like. So one organizing tool, right, is making sure that we stick together and finding ways to bring people together to meet needs that may not necessarily be linked to the political change that we want or the policy change that we want, but are about keeping us all together. So how do I get everybody in this room? Spreadsheets. So when we are building towards mass action, there are actually techniques and tactics we can use to know the size of the collective that we've built and to understand how we're gonna activate that group um, around certain kinds of uh, demands. So this is our spreadsheet from the September 8th unemployment action. In this spreadsheet, we listed every single person in the library unit, so, or in the faculty unit. So every single person who had been locked out and had a stake in whether or not we were gonna end a lockout and get back to our offices and get back to earning uh, salary and health insurance. So you list everyone and then you assess everyone. So you'll see uh, on the right, this current assessment, it was an assessment based on the demand, will you come to the unemployment action? So that's the question we ask every single member of the unit. And I can't say that enough. I'm gonna say it again, every single member of the unit. Any of us have put together a Facebook party and 80 people said they were gonna come and three people showed up, a library program, where you have a dozen RSVPs and nobody comes. Um, I'm a little nervous about my inaugural party this coming week because we've got 134 RSVPs, but what if nobody comes to my party, right? So you can't, it's not enough to simply put up a form and ask people to RSVP. Collective action and building that collective power requires talking to one another. Um, and so for this case, we the, the, the thing we were talking about was, are you going to come to the unemployment action? That's the question. We talk to people and rank them on a scale of one to five. Ones are people like me, organizers. Like when the, once the lockout hit, I was all in. I'm an all in kind of person. I was like 23 hours a day on the phone, uh, really activated and energized by uh, the urgency of the moment. So I'm a one, I'm calling people to get them to the uh, action. Uh, I'm calling people and asking them to call other people. I'm an organizer and I'm a one. Fives are people who don't want to do what you want to do, right? So 
they're the opposite of me. So if I'm organizing really hard to get people to come to the action, fives are organizing really hard to get people to stay away from the action. So those are the two poles. And then you work inwards. So twos are people who are going to show up to the unemployment action. And maybe they'll bring a friend, but they aren't going to make calls to organize other people. And the fours agree with the fives. They're going to convince maybe one other person to stay away, but they're not going to do anything beyond that. And then the threes are the people in the middle. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. So why am I assessing people like this? Well, it's because the unemployment action was both about mutual aid. It was about building a collective that could move as a single body, right? That we were able to move as a single body to the rally. But it's also about, uh, it was also about sort of attracting media attention. We wanted people to see our power. We wanted evidence that we were organized. And part of the way you show that is by getting everybody together and having somebody take a shot of it, right? Like this tells everybody that we're organized. So we don't wanna do the unemployment action until we know we have enough people that it kind of won't be embarrassing, right? <laughs> like we, it's a, it's a good idea, people are into it, they wanna do it. And when we call everybody together, they'll all show up in the room, right? Um, so you can do this for any kind of action that you're gonna take. So when we were organizing to get people to vote yes on the contract, we did an assessment. When we were trying to find out whether or not we had enough people organized to continue staying out, right? And like, like striking again because of the contract was bad, we had a rally and we assessed, are you gonna to come to the rally or not? And then, you know, we didn't have enough people come into the rally. So that told us that if you won't come to a rally, you're probably not going to go on strike. And that guided our decision making for our next action steps. So that assessment, you want to always be doing it, testing your power, seeing how many people you've got on your side uh, and making sure that you're only moving forward when you have the power built to make that make sense. So I'm talking about this in the context of like a union strike or union lockout. But I use assessments for everything now. I'm always wanting to make sure I've got the power built before I move. And that could be like a big thing, you know, like a, a, a lockout or a strike, but it can also be small things. I think about, think about any kind of a policy change that you've wanted to make in your library. Uh, the example I always use is the universal, I think, library issue of, will we purchase more staplers because staplers get stolen or will we chain the stapler to the desk so nobody walks away with it, right? So those are our, that's the question. If I'm on the side of people who want to just simply devote more budget to staplers because we know our patrons need staplers and they just get lost and that's what it's about. And I've got 12 people in my department who have to sort of inform this decision and our boss wants to chain the stapler, but I want us to push for more staplers I would do the same thing, make a list of all those 12 people, assess them relative to the demand. Do you, will you stand with me as we argue like in the meeting that we're going to get more staplers, right? Like you want to have that stuff organized so that you know before you step out how likely it is that you're going to win. So that's, I think, the er organizing tool that I learned during the lockout that when we think about making change, when we think about winning, we have to think about assessing, figuring out who we need to pull together to get what we want, assessing them relative to a demand that we're making in the moment, and making sure that we have a campaign of escalating actions that we're always power testing about, right? Because I think the image, this image is important, but it isn't the way that we, it isn't the only way that we win there's nothing organic about it. It has to be built and it has to be uh, organized. That's sort of the, the, the thing, the thing that like sort of motivates my work inside of ALA right now, that motivates uh, the talk that I'm giving to you right now is a real belief that the only way that we are going to turn the tide against what we're facing right now is through mass action. And that mass action can be built. We, there are techniques and strategies and ways that we can do that. Uh, and most crucial is that we have to do that together. So I'm going to stop my share now. 
if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's worth oh. Emily. <laughs> it worked. Did I stop my share? Okay. Indeed. Great. Yeah. Right. So thank you very much. Well, while we give yeah. Ruth a minute to like allow people to unmute themselves so they can stick their hands up. If people want to put Q and questions in the Q&A as well, I'll, I'll just mention something while we're getting that going, which is that in the UK at the moment, this is really timely because we've got some uh, some quite long running and ongoing strikes going on in, in yes. the library and, and higher education world. Uh, at the moment, there's a there's a strike on it. I think two of our members Leeds and MMU uh, and the, there's a there's a slightly wider strike at one, one of them tomorrow as well involving lots of library staff. Uh, so I've got a very vague question while people are getting started which mm -hmm. is that people have built that that impetus and that power base through the unions uh, in the UK and got started and trying to stick to it but it's really hard to carry on the momentum as well. If you have any Absolutely. tips on how yeah. you carry on that enthusiasm and momentum to keep going. I mean, the one in Leeds at the moment is an ongoing strike because there's a marking and assessment boycott by lecturers. So they've said, we're going to work to rule, we're not marking anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so the university's turned around and said, right, we're not paying you anything then. So there's a hundred percent pay deductions like people yep. effectively I... getting soaked. So it's really hard to just carry on to keep that going with that sort of absolutely it is it, like solidarity is extraordinarily difficult extraordinarily challenging and staying committed when uh sort of brute force is against you is a really tough call so we had a um so we got back in after 12 days the lockout ended and we were granted a, a contract extension um and we bar for another year and we continued to bargain so all of the intense feelings people had during the lockout once they got back to work sort of vanished yeah and so the organizing push to get a stronger contract was really impacted by that because like to be honest it's just like it's it's really hard you know it's very very difficult to stay committed when you're up against it in the lockout we got docked a full month of pay i can't imagine an open-ended strike where you're not getting paid like what that is like uh but it speaks to the need to have uh done a lot of organizing in advance to ensure that we've built up sufficient strike funds that we can credibly strike for an extended period of time um it takes galvanizing people about different like drawing on like everybody because it tends to fall on just a couple of people like i would say the lockout was organized like the fight against it was organized by like five of us you know it's exhausting people run out of steam they run out of energy uh so it's the reason you're always trying to turn your your threes to twos and your twos to ones so you're expanding the number of leaders that can sort of carry the weight and then the like very essential i think is that campaign of rising actions so that you're always getting little wins along the way because nothing feels better than a win and if you go months without a win that is just like it's just devastating to the movement so thinking about ways that we can get small wins in the process is crucial that's brilliant thank you got got a hands up to go to uh siobhan do you want to uh, unmute yourself and say anything um, yes, thank you so much for that keynote. That was absolutely brilliant. And I think as one of the librarians who will be on the picket line tomorrow, thank you so much for your support. It really means the world and also to my colleagues who are currently out. What I wanted to ask, and it, it may have been mentioned, my internet cut out a bit, um, would you have any advice for us as to what we can do in our day to day to positively disrupt the library and contribute to in changing our environment, especially to those of us who don't hold institutional powers, so say assistance and um, admin support, those of us who don't have managerial power and don't have the ability to make policy change? What do mm -hmm. we do every day to bring positive disruption and action to our libraries? Yeah, I'll say two things about that. First, I've never had, I had a brief period of managerial power. Two years during the uh, pandemic, I was in charge of my library. And it turns out that having a pro-labor person in a management position is important. It is like people with that kind of titular power will often tell you they don't have it, but you do, right? And you know, I know that we've got the ALN board listening in, 
And it is possible to be pro-labor in a management position. I did it. I was able to move three people up in title simply by enforcing the contract, which is what management and labor both should be doing at all times. And so moving people up in title, that means they get paid more and they have better job security. And they had been working and not being compensated for the level of work they were doing. And it's a ton of paperwork. And it's the kind of thing that managers never really feel up to doing because it's like easier to not do it. But enforce the contract if you're in a management position, that's really crucial and important. But I've, other than that two year stint and when I applied for the full-time job, they gave it to somebody else. So clearly they didn't want me in that spot because uh, you don't, you know, the, the people up here tend to not like uh, pro labor managers, but, um, uh, and it's, sorry, it's my early morning. So I'm just speaking freely about that. Uh, but for those of us who don't have managerial power, that's where the collective power piece is the only way to think about it and conceive of it. So even in contexts where you don't have the singular power to change policy, you do have group and collective power to push for things. So I think about meetings, for example, like a meeting where we're gonna discuss a proposed new policy. That meeting is a performative space where workers are gonna say something and management's gonna say something and management's eventually gonna decide like it doesn't feel good, like we don't like meetings. But if we think about meetings instead as like a performance of the power we've built as workers before we come into the meeting, then the meeting gets a lot more interesting. So you've got a policy change that you want to make. Management doesn't want to make it. If you could get everybody in the unit to come to the meeting and we've agreed that we're going to, we have one sort of pitch we're going to say, like we need to have more staplers because it's an equity issue or whatever the policy changes that you want to see. If you have every single person in the library, coming to that meeting ready to say that same thing and the reason that they want it from their perspective like on the system side i know that we need more staplers so that i don't have to program the um the stapler function on the photocopier which is always breaking right like there's a systems rationale there's a catalog or whatever right like if you have everybody in that meeting saying the same thing it becomes harder for management to say no right um not always, you're not always going to win, but I think that's where like I take those collective organizing principles into the um, into every sort of part of my library life, because that's where we work. That's where organizing can take place. I can't change the world. Right. But I can advocate in my library for things like longer hours, better staff, like policies, like eliminating late fees. All of those kinds of things become organizing issues. And when we organize together, we like each other a lot more. That's the other like side effect of all of this is like denser and thicker connections with our colleagues, which I think is is crucial in these moments. Like I'm reading in the chat about the Leeds strike, like we're going to need everybody supporting everybody at Leeds. And the best way to do that is for us to have a pre-existing relationship over something that was maybe less intense um, about opening hours or whatever. I don't know. That's that's my thought. But I don't know if, if you have others, Siobhan, that you want to share. I'm happy to talk to another question. Okay, fab, thank you. Next one's a written one. So we've got one in the QA, uh, okay. uh, which is appropriate for this time in the morning to you. Uh, it says, how does it impact you to always be the organiser? It must be exhausting. How do you encourage others to be organisers to share that burden more equitably? Yeah, that's why organisers go in and out, right? Like I am all in for this ALA thing. I've been organising my tiny off for a year and I've got another year um, and then when it's done I'm going to take a big long rest so it's important to, to acknowledge that we can't always be organizing um, I think the best way somebody or so as an organize like somebody who organizes things I love being organized I don't know if other people feel that but when people organize me I'm like thank you that was amazing so I have a friend Jenna who um, is a, a really kind of diehard blood donor you know, and like, it's important. Donating blood is crucial. I've had cancer a few years ago and the blood of other humans like kept me from, you know, kept me up on my feet for a big part of my treatment. And uh, the way she organized me was by asking me to go with her. She said, Emily, I'm going to go donate platelets. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, well, sure. I want to hang out with Jenna. So I think one of the things is like, ask people to do it with you and go with you and try to get them um, engaged that way. So like I need a ton of people to help me with this a with this ALA thing, right? And I had a like campaign group, and a now I have an advisory group, and 
doing things with them together that are like social and fun, but also about getting wins together. So for the first time, I think maybe ever, we're going to have some pro you, well, not first time, maybe ever. I think I keep thinking that like, if you look at the history of the American Library Association, it's actually pretty radical, but we're going to be hosting two uh, webinars, how to form a union and how to negotiate a first contract. Um, and we're able to do that pro-union programming because I've got a lot of people who are pro-union. They know that I'm pro-union. We've been organizing together. You know, we get some wins together. We uh, laugh together. We, you know, it's just the, the comradeship is what's really crucial and important. Like those of you at Leeds, like how tight are you now with your colleagues because you've been through and you continue to go through something together. Um, and so, you know, building those connections prior uh, to a big action, I think is important. But yeah, ask somebody to go with you and make it fun. You know, it's not all dire all the time. Um, my friend Leah, comrade Leah and I, the ALA president thing is sort of our joint project. Um, and I'd say what makes, what really helped us win is that all we do is laugh. We just make each other laugh constantly. So have a comrade. That's pretty, that's great advice. Uh, anybody else want to stick their hand up before I go to the next written one? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the next one, which, which might be the last one. We might squeeze two in. We'll see. So, so this question is from Catherine in the chat, which is, uh, about so when it's the right time to sort of start talking rather than protesting it's uh when do you decide the time is okay to accept to be flexible to start the negotiations oh let me you know i don't i don't know that kind of thing is so particular you know um mm. what i what i'd say is like you knew Oh my God, Evelyn, I'm sorry, I'm getting caught up in the chat, but Evelyn, that's a question that I ask myself constantly. Um, why don't the right burned out, burn out? You know what the answer is to that question? They have organized money behind them. That is the answer. If we had organized money, we would be, we would have a lot more uh, chance to rest. But I think like the project of deciding when to move, like when to uh, go out for the rally, when to return to the table, when to, all of those things are, determined by a sort of constant reflection on the power that we've built. So you can only stay out on strike as long as a super majority of people are out on strike with you, right? Because it doesn't make, if I withhold my labor, but a bunch of other people are sort of turning in grades anyway, because like whatever that they need their paycheck, like which is legitimate and speaks to the need for, um, you know, not tying survival to employment, uh, but like that, is just based on how much power we've got. So at the end of our lockout, we negotiated a new contract that we continued to negotiate. The contract was not good. It was not a whole lot better than what we had resisted in the first place. But the reason that we signed it, I believe, is that we didn't have enough people that were sort of organized and galvanized to stay sort of on strike or on the, like that burnout is really real. And so it's why you're always constantly testing your power. So we had this rally um, and it was like a rally for a fair contract. And we, uh, it was supposed to rain. I ordered like a hundred ponchos for a hundred people that would come out to the protest from um, uh, the faculty. And I think I handed out maybe 20 ponchos. Mm -hmm. So that told me that we weren't ready to strike for sure and that we had to return to the negotiating table. So, but those kinds of like, it's Monday morning quarterbacking. If you've been involved in any kind of labor action like this, you know, you get back in and immediately people are like, you should have stayed out. We should have gotten more. And that, that's just part of what a union is. That's part of what you want. Actually, you want at the end of a negotiation, you want people to be demanding more from the union because those are the people who are gonna sort of take over the organizing piece um, on your way out. Yeah, but you're always sort of guessing. Yeah, Brilliant. and that nicely ties together with that element in the chat as well about uh, how the far right can just yeah keep the emphasis up because they just have to pay somebody to to do stuff, don't they? They've got the money, they've got the commitment, whereas we have to have solidarity all the time to uh, to resist. So our time's up. Thank you so much for that, Emily. That was that was fantastic. Uh,
and I'm sure you'll have tons of people at your inauguration party next week. So it's, uh, yeah. I, just, I don't want it just to be me. It's like my great fear. But I see um, it's been a real, a real joy to speak with you all. Thank you so much. And solidarity with folks at Leeds. And uh, thank you for sharing that information with me. I'll, I'll promote that strike fund. So thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot. And, uh, goodbye. So, Bye, everyone. So, so for everyone.